Plastics are used in an enormous range of products. And that's surprising, because they're barely a hundred years old. And it's only in the last 50 years that their full versatility has been appreciated and exploited. Today, there are few domestic or industrial objects that don't contain plastics. Few that haven't had their design, their performance, even their durability improved by plastic materials. The Mini Metro, possibly the most important British car of the decade, uses plastics to great and admirable purpose. Bumpers and front grills are formed from plastic material because it doesn't corrode easily and absorbs minor impacts more efficiently than metal. Electrical control boxes and wires use plastics because of their excellent insulation properties. Oil filter housing, the cooling fan, containers for coolant and brake fluid, they're all made from plastics, which are light and can be formed into intricate shapes with relative ease. The interior is finished with various plastic materials. Plastic is hard wearing, stain resistant, and it doesn't scratch easily. Some plastics flex and collapse under impact, and that makes them particularly valuable in increasing the safety of passengers. But above all, the relative lightness of plastic has done a great deal to reduce petrol consumption for motorists. The lighter the body, the more the mileage. Plastics belong to a group of chemicals called polymers. Polymers include fibers, paints, adhesives and rubber. The name polymer describes their molecular structure. The building block in the manufacture of polymers is a simple molecule called a monomer. In the creation of a plastic material, thousands of monomer molecules are encouraged to join together to form larger molecules. To persuade the molecules to be sociable, an initiator or catalyst is usually introduced to help the chemical reaction. Then the molecules combine to form long strings or chains composed of thousands of monomer units. These chains are formed in a quite random way, some short, some long, all twisted and tangled like spaghetti. The joining together of monomers to produce these long chains is called polymerization. Here we can see the process at work. In the beaker, two different liquids containing two monomers. Where the liquids meet, the monomers react. The polymer is formed and it can be drawn off. The plastic material being formed here is the best known plastic of all, nylon. It made its debut in wartime. Nylons for glamour, parachutes for pilots. The hundreds of thousands of tangled chains that compose the nylon lend the material astonishing strength. The raw materials for making plastic usually come from oil, although they can be made from other organic materials such as coal, wood or vegetable sources. This refinery is producing vinyl chloride. At room temperature, it's a heavy gas. Under pressure, it becomes a liquid, and it's usually used in this form. Vinyl chloride is the building block for polyvinyl chloride, PVC, and it's made from ethylene and chlorine. The vinyl chloride liquid is pumped to the polymerizing plant in the refinery. Here, it enters a pressure vessel called an autoclave. In the autoclave, the vinyl chloride is mixed with water and a catalyst, which sparks off the reaction. In this batch process, 95% of vinyl chloride is converted to PVC. The remaining vinyl chloride gas is trapped in the solid particles of PVC. The PVC itself is in the form of a suspension in the water. To dry it out, the slurry is sprayed into this 50-foot high cone and mixed with hot air. Fine powder is precipitated, and this is put in bags. 
there are two kinds of synthetic polymers, thermosetting plastics and thermoplastics. The main advantage with thermoplastics is that they can be reshaped many times over. When a thermoplastic is heated, it softens. And this means that the molecular chains can be made to slip over each other. The plastic can be forced into a new shape, and when it cools, it'll retain this shape. If it's reheated, then force can be used once again to make the chains slip over each other a second time. This will produce a new shape, and when the material cools, that new shape will be retained. Because of this ability to be reshaped, there is negligible waste. What waste there is can be recycled and used in the manufacturing process again. There is a disadvantage. Thermoplastics can't be used for components which are subject to relatively high temperatures. Generally speaking, thermosetting plastics can withstand relatively high temperatures without melting. When a thermosetting plastic is heated, it softens and it can be formed into a shape. But a chemical change also begins to take place. Bonds are formed between the molecular chains. These are called cross-links, and they lock the molecular chains into a permanent network position. When the curing is complete, the shape is fixed. No matter how often the plastic is reheated, the shape will remain unchanged. So, thermosetting plastics tend to be used where relatively high temperatures are likely to be encountered, in this electric fan heater, for instance. The properties of plastics can be varied in the laboratory and in the production process to provide rigidity, if rigidity is what is wanted, as in the parts of this refrigerator, or flexibility, as in these shampoo bottles. Different plastics provide different mechanical properties. This sample of polystyrene will break with a drawing load of 15 kilograms force with little visible elongation. It has very low ductility. On the other hand, this sample of polypropylene will draw for a considerable time before it finally snaps because it's so very ductile. Similarly, the impact strength of plastics can vary a great deal. In this particular test, a piece of polystyrene, breakage occurs at 0.27 joules. A piece of ABS, acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, will withstand the same impact force without breaking. The great range of properties you find in the world of plastics naturally makes them very popular with designers and manufacturers. These washing machines are using polymers in place of metal, a move which has affected their design in a significant way. The most vital part of a washing machine is the tub which holds the water, and it has a very demanding role to play. It's got to withstand the constantly changing temperatures, the action of detergents and water, and it's got to be capable of mass production. The majority of washing machines on sale have a metal tub similar to this one. The tub has brackets so that it can be mounted into the machine chassis and receive the various pieces which have to be attached to it, pipes, springs and the motor. It's all very complicated and the whole assembly process itself is long and painstaking. Metal drums are fabricated from a number of separate pressings. Sheet metal is gradually pressed into the right shape. Holes for the water hoses have to be stamped out of the pressings. Brackets have to be welded into position. All in all, a tub like this one requires 16 separate components which have all been pressed and then welded together. But a metal tub still requires treatment to protect it from the corrosive action of water and detergents. 
The metal is sprayed with a slurry of minute particles of glass, clay and water. The tubs are then dried and passed through an oven. The heat, over 800 degrees centigrade, causes the glass to melt and it fuses to the prepared metal surface. The process is called vitreous enameling. And it produces a tough, hard-wearing, protective coating with good chemical resistance. A few years ago, a washing machine manufacturer did some research into the feasibility of using plastic instead of metal to cut down on manufacturing costs. A prototype tub was made which proved that plastics could do the job very well indeed if a few problems could be ironed out. The main drawback was a fault which often occurs when you move from metal to plastic. After testing, cracks were found in these supporting struts. Polymers dislike sharp corners because they lead to concentrations of stress. And stress manifests itself in cracks. The stress occurs from the differential cooling you get when a polymer is formed. This transparent plastic square has been molded from hot plastic entering a die at the top of the picture. As it reached the bottom of the die, it became cooler and stress built up, which on further cooling was solidified into the square. This bar of molded plastic has internal stresses in it, but they're well distributed. But the same bar molded with a sharp nick in it shows a high degree of stress has built up around the nick. It's the concentration of stress which reduces the toughness of the component. This can be demonstrated with impact testing. Without the nick, the bar breaks at 0.5 joules force. With the nick, the bar breaks at less than 0.1 joules, an 80% reduction in its toughness. The solution? Make the strut curve gently so that the internal stresses are evenly distributed. Crucially important is the bearing supporting the drum. This has to be exactly on center. If the drum is spinning with an unbalanced load of wet washing, it'll tend to deflect and start wobbling. If the deflection becomes too erratic and the drum begins to spin against the side of the tub, it could cause a great deal of damage. In production, the metal bearing support is placed in the mold and the tub is formed round it. This ensures that the tub is formed with the bearing accurately on center. The tub is made from a special glass reinforced polypropylene, but added to this polymer is a foaming agent. As the molten polymer is injected into the mold under pressure, the foaming agent produces bubbles of gas. The polymer foams. This helps fill the mold. But it also produces a honeycomb effect in the cold molding, which provides both strength and lightness. When clothing is spun dry, the tub is subjected to severe centrifugal force and strength is essential. The polymer also has a very high resistance to fatigue strain, which is a problem for metal drums, especially at the weld joints. The plastic molding includes small cores, bosses, and the brackets for securing motors and pipes all of them an integral part of the design. These and the holes for the pipes are all formed when the molding is made. This makes things much easier at the final assembly stage. Also, being polymer, it's easy to fit self-tapping screws, which of course speeds up assembly. Water pipes can be connected to the tub in a matter of seconds using rubber grommets and a rubber solution to complete the seal. One disadvantage of this plastic polypropylene is that it's flammable. 
So the water heater has to have additional fail-safe cutouts to prevent it from overheating and possibly catching fire. Altogether, some 12 components are attached to the tub, which is then suspended in the housing by springs. The sound damping properties of structural foam polymers make this machine much quieter than ones fitted with metal tubs. Polymers often have extra materials added to them to improve their properties. This cotton fabric sheet has been impregnated with a thermosetting phenolic resin. The sheets are then stacked in layers so that the weave of one is at right angles to the sheet below and above it. This helps to prevent directional weaknesses. The sheets are built up layer by layer, giving the material its name, a laminate. The sheets can be made from paper or cotton fabric, and there's a wide choice of resins, epoxy, polyester, polyamide, and phenolic. The laminates are held between metal sheets and then loaded into a steam-heated press. The press is closed. As the impregnated resin melts and flows, cross-linking within the resin bonds the layers together into a single solid sheet. Surplus resin is forced out like jam from a sandwich. As the material has now been thermoset, any further heating won't soften it or alter its shape. The laminate of compressed sheets is now extremely rigid and ready for machining. Many different kinds of cross-section can be made using a wide variety of press shapes. Industrial laminates have been around now for over 50 years and they're used for all sorts of engineering components. This laminate is being machined into a gear. Much cheaper than metal gears, laminates are also considerably quieter in operation. You machine laminates in the same way you'd machine non-ferrous metals, and you can achieve similar machine speeds and cuts using very similar tools. This cam, also made from laminate, is used in a machine for sewing and closing the toes on women's tights. The form of the cam controls an essential part of the machine. A large number of these machines are exported to developing countries, so they need to be robust and capable of maintenance and adjustment with simple tools and equipment. The machine can manufacture up to 900 pairs of tights an hour. With a metal cam, the noise generated at these speeds was deafening. The laminate cam is much quieter. The biggest advantage of the laminate cam is its relatively hard-wearing properties. Aluminium cams used to wear quite quickly, and when that happened, the machine would need complicated adjustment or the cam had to be replaced. Virtually no laminate cams have had to be replaced since they were first introduced.
British Rail's high-speed trains depend for a large part of their exterior and interior appearance on the versatility of polymers. The task facing the designers was to create an aerodynamic shape which would also be strong enough to withstand high-speed impact with large birds. Both steel and aluminium were considered, but were rejected. Steel would have been too heavy. There would have been problems with welding, and the tooling costs would have been prohibitive for a limited production run of only 150 units. Aluminium panels would have required costly hand beating, and there would have been electrolytic problems set up between the aluminium and the steel frame of the train, which could have led to corrosion. The solution was to build the cab from GRP, glass reinforced plastic. The cab has two skins, the outside skin is yellow, the inside grey. The outer skin is made in one piece. Layers of glass fibre are placed one after the other on a mould carved from wood and plywood. Then they're impregnated with a plastic resin. The resin was especially developed to make it as fireproof as possible. The glass fibre is woven in a cross-plied sheet and these sheets are progressively layered so that the direction of the cross-ply is alternated giving the outer skin greater resistance to impact damage. The inner skin is made with three separate moulds. This is one of the moulds of the lower part of the skin. It's built up in the same way as the outer skin. Wood and metal inserts are also placed on the mould. These are covered with glass fibre and resin and form part of the moulding structure. Although the function of the wood is mainly to provide a location for the metal inserts, it incidentally gives additional strength and rigidity to the curved edge of the moulding. The metal insert provides a location for the bolts which join this inner skin to the outer skin. The inner skin is laid over the outer skin with a two and a half inch gap between the two. This cavity is made into sections of one meter square and then filled with a plastic foam. The foam is injected through tubes so that the cavity is completely filled. The foam binds the two skins together and, more importantly, provides the great strength that the cab needs. The foam enables the cab to absorb the impact of a four-pound bird hitting the train at a combined speed of 125 miles an hour. The plastic used for the foam is rigid polyurethane, a thermosetting plastic often used when foaming is required. Plastics are also used in the new coaches because they're light, hard-wearing and easily cleaned. They can be formed into complex shapes and an unlimited number of different features can be built into their design. In fact, the range of synthetic polymers is a wide one and this makes them an excellent choice for an ever-increasing range of products.